Hello, my name is Beth McMahon. I'm the Gillespie County Horticulture Extension Agent. And welcome to part two of transitioning your spring garden into a fall garden. Now, I realize some of y'all didn't see the part one, and that's, that's totally all right. It's not going to hurt my feelings any, but I'm glad y'all are joining us for part two. So just to review from part one, in part one, we discussed which vegetables we are going to keep and which ones we're going to get rid of. So I have went ahead and gotten rid of the vegetables that we discussed, as well as a few others. So let's take a quick look. Uh, if y'all remember from the first video, we talked about the lima beans and how healthy they were and such. So we're going to keep those, and I did end up keeping those because they're still producing, they're still flowering, they're still doing great. We also talked about the Zuni dried beans that were right beside them. If you look, it kind of looks like there's nothing there anymore, and that's totally all right. They um, had a bit of pill bug damage eating their stems, so I went ahead and pulled them. We also talked about keeping some of the zucchini plants and getting rid of the, some of the yellow squash plants. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at that row. Um, that's the silver row. Oh, the silver row. So if you remember from the first video, there was a lot more plants there than there were our are right now. And yes, I did get rid of pretty much all of them. I started pulling some of the yellow squash and I looked at the roots and they had root knot nematodes. And then I pretty much every one of them that I pulled up had a pretty bad case of root knot nematodes. So I ended up getting rid of most of them, except for the second planting zucchini and I'm not expecting those to do anything. They're just there. I couldn't have the heart in me to get rid of them. Uh, we talked about the peppers, how we were going to keep those, and they're looking pretty great. Producing nicely, looking healthy. They should go till first frost, no problem at all. And then we talked about the tomatoes. So the tomatoes aren't looking like 100% great. But they're not looking like they're on their last legs either, and yes, I know there's dead leaves in there. I know, I know. They probably don't look as nice as your tomato plants do. They've got spider mites. Give the poor things a break. But they've still got a pretty good amount of green growth, and I think that they can carry that into the fall, so I'm pretty much going to leave them alone. I did take out the Vernissage Black Cherry Plum Tomato that was on the end, and I don't regret that because the plant was looking pretty bad. So, with that, that... Um, we're going to talk about what you can do, the fun part now, actually getting into some of the planting for a fall garden. However, first, before you plant, you need to go over a few things. One, you need to uh, clear out your cover crop, and I have done that in this row. Now, I will admit that I left a bit of my cover crop, aka weeds, towards the end, as well as um, some pumpkins that are still alive and producing back there. So they're going to stay there until I need the space for fava beans later on in the year. A second thing you need to be aware of is crop rotation, and this is probably before you go out and clean a row like I did with my onion row. We don't want to plant the same thing in the same spot every year, so that's why we rotate. So if you have beans in one row, you don't want to plant beans there the next year. Or if you have tomatoes in one row, you don't want to plant tomatoes there the next year. Uh, you want to at least have like a two to three rotation. So what was here was vining squash. So according to my crop rotation, I'm perfectly fine putting a root crop in. Now this section of area has had nematodes in the past. I didn't see that on the vining squash so that might be a little bit of an issue, but I'm going to go ahead and risk it because I have nematodes pretty much everywhere in my garden, and the carrots are not a high priority crop. They're kind of something that's nice, but they're not something that I truly, truly love. So, another thing is, being an extension program, you need to have a soil test. Ooh, This garden hasn't had one for three years, so I decided, well, you know what, it's time. I'm going to go ahead and take one. Now this is going to be a little bit difficult to show. Okay. Uh, is it focusing? Ah, focus. There we go. So that's the soil test. 
you'll see that the pH is 7.8. That's the top line. That's kind of high, but there's really nothing I can do about it because the soil is above a calcium carbonate, and you really can't alter that soil pH too much. My nitrate, my nitrogen looks pretty good. You were looking at the CL line, the little dashed line right there. That'll tell you uh, that's the critical level, so it's pretty good. I'll probably add some later. Phosphorus is so high, which means that I can't really add any uh, fertilizer that has that in there. So manure, manures, and compost is pretty much out. Potassium's good, calcium's good, magnesium's good. Sulfur is unusually good, kind of scarily so. Definitely don't want to change the soil pH by using that. Iron is low, but I'll add that as needed. Zinc, manganese, copper, and boron is good. So, soil test says that we're good to go, nutrient-wise. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at where we're going to be planting our carrots. All right, watch out, camera lady. There's a sunflower behind you. So this is where I'm going to be planting the carrots. This soil has been turned over at least two or three times because when you're planting carrots, you want to have a good, loose soil. There's also a little bit of moisture too. And thankfully, there's not a lot of these. So Fredericksburg, Gillespie County is part of the Texas Hill Country and we grow rocks like crazy. They just seem to pop out of the ground no matter where you're at. This garden thankfully doesn't have a lot of them, thanks to the people who gardened it in the past. <laughs> but sometimes a rock does appear every now and then. And you don't want a lot of rocks in your carrot bed because they will cause the roots to fork. So we want to get rid of the rocks. Next, we're going to make sure that it's nice and loose. And it is nice and loose, so I'm going to go ahead and brush the soil away. Not too terribly much. So with the carrots, I collect my own seed. This variety is Danvers 126. One Danvers 126. It's not an imperator. Imperator. I M P E R A T O R type. But um, so it's not going to get. It's not those super long carrots that you sometimes see in the grocery store. This is a shorter type. So my soil, while it is fairly deep right here, this type, will, uh, I don't have to worry much as much about the carrot not getting the full length. So um, I collect my own carrot seeds. Danvers 126 is an open pollinated variety. So I let, well, I kind of forgot about my carrots and I, well, not forgot about them. I took what I wanted and then I left some of the other ones to uh, produce seed heads. So this is what a seed head looks like for carrots. Um, the seeds are kind of like little burrs. So, um, I'm not going to sprinkle it off the head, though I potentially could. Just wanted to show y'all that if y'all want to collect your own seed. I'm going to take the carrot seed and sprinkle it on the ground. There's a lot of, uh, shaft with this. Kind of helps spread the carrot seed out. And it's kind of hard to separate too, so. I'm also going to take a little bit of this. Okay, so I've got my carrot seed planted. I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of soil down. You don't want to cover up your carrot seed too much. But because this area is kind of hot and dry, I do want to cover it up some. Then I'm going to go ahead and water my seed in right away. Because it's not going to grow unless you water it. We haven't been getting rain recently. Like, it hasn't rained significantly since June, which has been kind of annoying. It always goes around Harper, so 
giving it some supplemental water is extremely important. You don't want to use something that has too much pressure. You want to have, use something that has like a gentle flow when you're watering, because otherwise it'll wash too much of the soil off the seeds. This is pretty much just wetting the top layer. I do have a soaker hose that I'm going to put down, which will give it a more thorough soaking. This is just kind of to get it started and to settle the dirt. Okay. So here's my soaker hose. Now you will note that I do have drip irrigation in this section. However, that's not going to come, I don't want to have to turn on my entire system just to run one line. So I've got this soaker hose right here. I can go ahead and lay this and that way I don't have to turn on the entire system. I'll just turn on this section. I'm going to come back and plant more carrots later, so it won't hurt it to get this other area wet too. The rest of this area for right now is going to be for spinach, which I'm going to plant later in September. Leaving the end sticking out. Okay. Also, want to mark where I planted the carrot seed because you know what? I'm prone to forgetting things. So that's pretty much the area that I have to worry about right now for the carrots. Now this section is going to dry out fairly quickly right now, especially if I don't, and I don't want to keep the water running 24 seven. So one trick that I can use to kind of help the carrot seeds to germinate is I could put a sheet over them. This is an old sheet I use to cover plants. Got it at a, uh, at a thrift store. You don't need to have anything fancy for this but it works. I did wash it before I used it. So, I'm gonna go ahead and lay that sheet over it and then I'm going to later on wet the sheet so that there's additional moisture. Now, if the carrot seed comes up, you'll kinda wanna check this daily or every two days to make sure that your carrot seed is coming up and uh, you're not suppressing it. Um, it, it's getting enough light, so you'll want to remove the sheet when it starts to germinate and you start to see green leaves. So, da -da, da -da. two that, layers. Um, it doesn't have to have two layers, but I have two layers right here just, just in case because the soil is going to dry out pretty quickly, but this will help it keep nice and moist. So, let's go ahead and go over to where we're going to plant the broccoli now. walking. We're walking. We stopped? We stopped. Okay, so this is the first row. That's asparagus off to the side. This row is a little bit wild, but it's usually, um, I haven't had issues with root knot nematodes in it, and that's kind of important. 
So typically with broccoli and the other cold crops, we don't have that many issues with root-knot nematodes because they're planted when the soils are more, well in the spring, at least the soils are cooler and the root-knot nematodes are not as active. Right now the nematodes are active and they're hungry, so if I planted this broccoli in an area where it could potentially encounter them, it would have some galling. So I'm going to plant them in this first row where I haven't really had that many root-knot nematode issues, if any at all, and so they should be pretty safe from that. Um, now, crop rotation-wise, I didn't have broccoli or any kind of coal crop in this row last year, though I did have it a couple of years ago. So it's been about a two-year rotation. That's not ideal, but it was only the first part of the row, so I think I can get away with it. Now, it is a little bit early to be planting broccoli. However, my first frost can be potentially uh, the last week of October, if not a little bit earlier. Broccoli is frost resistant, but it's not hard freeze resistant, well, without a little bit of protection. And I can potentially get these starting November. So if I want a crop before I have to cover a lot, I do have to plant a little bit earlier than other people would. You should be able to start, you should start seeing broccoli and cauliflower, other cold crop transplants in your local nurseries and such. I was at one this weekend and I did see some, but I grow my own because I like specific varieties. This variety is Green Magic. It's more heat tolerant than other broccoli types, and it's pretty good broccoli for our area. So it is a variety that I would recommend. A lot of the um, nurseries carry it, so it should be relatively easy to find too, which is another good point. So let's go ahead and plant this guy. Hmm. Okay. So one problem I have in this garden is fire ants and other types of ants, but the fire ants tend to like nesting in stems of things. So before I put this broccoli out, I did put out a spinosad ant bait. You can't use other types, you gotta use something like that because uh, it's more garden safe. The other ones can only be applied around the borders unless the label says otherwise. So I used an ant bait a couple days ago to kind of hopefully knock the ant population down though I know that they will be back because there's moist soil here. I'm going to locate a emitter. There's one right here. Dig the hole. I had potatoes here this spring. Unfortunately, Sometimes there's still a little bit that you never get. That's soil leaf nightshade. I'm going to gently squeeze the pot. That's well rooted on the, uh, it's pretty well rooted. Not super over well rooted, but well rooted enough. I'm gonna plant it. I'm gonna plant it so that I cover up all the potting soil because if you leave a little bit exposed, it's gonna wick the moisture out quicker. However, I don't want to bury too much of the stem because if I do, you're going to have a lot of side sprouts and it's not going to be like a good big crown. Okay. So there, I've got my little broccoli planted. And I'm going to go ahead and water it in. It does need more water, but because y'all probably don't want to watch me filling up a watering can, which doesn't sound very exciting, I'm going to water it a little bit more later. Now, another thing, I mentioned that I have ants here, and I've actually had problems with ants nesting in cauliflower and broccoli stems, of all things. They don't build ant hills, they just nest in the stems, or they'll gnaw the stems. So because I actually want these, I'm probably going to treat them with an insecticide preventively. Now I don't have any gloves on right now and the plant is still wet, so I'm not going to apply this right now. But um, this is a carboryl insecticide. This is not a brand recommendation. Uh, but using this one, it has a residue. So that means that I don't have to continuously spray to keep the ants off. This is not an organic option. I do realize that, but I want something that'll stick around so that I don't have to keep spraying, and those usually are not organic options. 
Diatomaceous earth might work if you're organic, but when the ants are desperate, it's probably not going to be super effective. So I'll apply this on the stem just a little bit later. And I'm not afraid of hurting bees with this because there's nothing there to attract the bees right now. So, with that, we planted our first coal crop. We planted carrots, other cool season vegetables we can plant, but not right now because it's still a little bit too hot. Those will be more in September and such, so you'll have to stay tuned for another video. As I said before, my name is Beth McMahon. I'm the Horticulture Extension Agent for Gillespie County. And if you have any questions, well, please, hopefully you've been putting them in the chat box.